Welcome back to the Op Show, where we bring you the trials and tribulations, automations and collaborations from the world of DevOps and the developer experience. I'm your host, Tristan Pollack, with my co-host, CTO.ai CEO, Kyle Campbell. And in our best show yet, Chuka <laughs> Ophili is a renaissance man, DevOps guru, Nigeria-based software engineer, so many other things. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you mentor at Google, yeah. uh, you work at work with Gigster. So we're excited yeah. to hear, hear about all these aspects. Uh, mm. Not only do you have an amazing camera and setup, uh, <laughs> but you know you do a lot of YouTubing as well. So, uh, yes. you know, welcome, Chuka. It's so great to have you on the show. Great to be here, man. Great to be here. Fun stuff. <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about your story. Like, how did you, Howard? How did you get, you know, to where you are today uh, in the development world? Yeah. So uh, I've told the story quite a number of times, but not many people have heard it, right? Um, so I, I started out in technology, um, funny stories because of gaming, you know, as a four, maybe five, I guess, six year old kid who her, his mom was a programmer. She used to program for a company called uh, UTC. Well, what we know as programming then I think was, co uh, you know, software like uh, Fortran and Cobol. And that's what they were using now stack at the time. And she used to have follow home work so she'll bring the computers home then we had this big gigantic C crt monitors that she'll bring home and she had two computers and you know i was always fascinated by them and she'll say uh you know do not touch but because i'm a kid i gotta touch right and then she'll load up games i'd have fun prince of persia pac-man you know and then it became a recurring thing that every evening when she brought work home not every evening but every other evening where she brought work home i'd want to play a video game so she would always have to get up and set it up for me and one day she got really tired and she said hey chuka i'm going to set this thing up for you once and you have to figure it out from this day forward so i had to actually pay attention well how she took the flash disk put it in ran the command to change the directory look for the game list the uh, command list the name of the application before running and executing the application and that kind of stuck and that's where my journey actually began so I started you know uh, playing with you know other games I'd go to you know a computer club a computer school back then in primary school and then you know would exchange games with friends come back home try to load them and then I stumbled on something called the help right? You know, it was Microsoft disk operating system. Then, you know, it was a two bit, no windows, nothing. And, you know, the help was very helpful because it had descriptive information of what that command did. So I'd spend hours going through each command and just, you know, learning what they did. And to be honest, that's where my journey went from, you know, got in secondary school, found the computer club straight away, did my first program in basic, and then got to university, somewhere in between ran, you know, what we call like a business center. We call business centers where people can come print documents and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then taught people how to use, you know, the Internet Explorer, which came eventually, how to use the, you know, operating system. And then, you know, it kept going. I got to a stage where I started doing hardware, started doing networking, uh, putting cyber cafes together, setting up internet connections, you know, and then graduated to, you know, coding when I did my first website job, uh, did my first web application, you know, and it just, just, just kept going. So um, my story is more around, most times someone asked me, Chuka, can you do this? And my default answer is always yes whether I knew it or not. And then I would go find the requisite knowledge. But I think the period in my life that really accelerated my, you know, enthusiasm for tech was while I was in the University of Lagos. Um, it, you know, it, it, I, I ran into a friend, uh, his name is Kunle. I ran into a friend who kind of, was setting up a cyber cafe and he had heard you know about some of my background you know and there were not many people like me at the time and you know he invited me over so i had free i mean after we helped set up the cafe but i had free access to the internet that was the first thing and then the second thing was i had the opportunity to experiment because when those computers went down or were bad i was the guy to fix it so all that was tremendously helpful i mean at the time you know it might have looked weird but it was very helpful. It kind of shaped the individual I am today. So 
Couple that with curiosity and always want to be at the forefront of what's happening, what's the latest thing that's going on. I never really want to be left behind. So I'm always learning from not just the younger ones, but the older ones. I'm always in conversation, trying to figure out what are they talking about? I don't like it when I don't know when someone is talking about something I don't know, right? So I'm always going to do more research and it's an ongoing process till today, you know? Um, eventually got recognized in my own little ecosystem, started about two startups. One was a well, one wasn't a startup. One was a consulting company and did that for about 15 years, and that's where I did all the outsourcing work through, and then slowed that down and started uh, a company called with a friend called uh, Field Insights. It used to be called Delivery Science, but we ran it to Field Insights. Um, we built an application that helped you know enterprise companies gather data from the field, um, and then I left that, you know, the company's still running, but I left that to pursue something else, which is still in the cooler. I'm not going to talk about it much. Uh, and then <laughs> all the while still out, you know, uh, more like freelancing with uh, Gigster. So still freelancing with Gigster till today. Um, and um, along the line became what we call a Google developer expert. And that's someone who's recognized uh, in their field as a thought leader with not just cloud products or Google products, but just generally in technology. Uh, there are about five of us in Nigeria and maybe just two of us in cloud. And in the world, there's 700 of us, right? Um, I'm a certified uh, professional cloud architect and I am a mentor in the Launchpad program. Um, for those of those who don't know what the Launchpad program, actually it's now called Google for Startups, right? It used to be called the Launchpad program. But um, the way I got into that was uh, in 20, 2017 or 2018, our startup then, the Field Inside startup, got drafted as one of the first four African startups from Nigeria, from Africa, to get into the global program. And they were in their fourth class. So we were the fourth set and what were the first set from Africa, you know, and the program is all about mentorship. They're trying to help you. You're in growth stage. They, they bring mentors from all around the world. They bring people from the Google team, you know, to try and give you insights, information, just help you be better. They take you through this two week intensive boot camp, boot camp on site in San Francisco. And, but the whole program is for six months and, you know, got to meet a lot of people. And then they, in the process found that, oh, well, this chap who's the engineering lead here is very experienced. Let's call him back next year as a mentor. So that's how I got it came back the following year as a mentor, myself and my co-founder, we came back the following year as mentors in the program. Um, I was an, a tech mentor. And then later on, they said they were starting the regional programs, which is the program for Africa. And, you know, I've been a mentor since in the Africa region since, since class one. And I think they're in the fifth class right now, actually it's going on right now. It should be uh, the, the fifth class. Uh, the second segment is ending tomorrow. So I've been actually actively involved in that. Okay, I'll stop my monologue for now. What a, great story. Oh, what a great yeah, story. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. We should have just started at what you what you yeah. haven't done. And then yeah. that would have been such a great story. I, yeah. I, especially yeah. the conversation with the early days and the floppy disk and going through and yeah. at, like I uh, that's exactly how I got into computers too. And I was getting a little nostalgic there for a minute. Yeah. yeah, you'd be shocked at how many people started out that way. It was gaming and I still love games. Like I'm still like, uh, I still play FIFA like every other day, uh, every other chance I can get. Play Call of Duty, some, you know, first person shooter games, you know, but gaming was the real attraction and then it kind of stuck. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there are a bunch of us who started around the same time with the same, you know, passion. Yeah, I think there is. And then the other thing I often notice with people who end up getting into pro programming is there's this sort of creative theme theme either music you know and there's sort of a mathematical component to that often or just you mm -hmm. know math sciences these sorts of things maybe um just a, a propensity for like logical problem solving and like you said starting mm -hmm. with yes and then figuring it out uh along the way right yeah 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 that's it i mean coincidentally you know i i i, I just did a youtube video it's not i think it's barely three weeks three days old and this is exactly what we just talked about. Right. This is exactly what cool. I was just saying. Yeah, this is exactly what Head I was just saying in the video. Head that, over. Hey, subscribe, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, YouTube.com, check off Philly, shameless plug, but that's it. There. We'll put that in the link <laughs> drop in, right, Tristan? Oh yeah, that, here it is, right here. <laughs> cool. Oh wow! And there's some <laughs> cool. other great ones here too. Um, this one, I yeah. uh, this one, I'm $65 gonna sixty-five dollar Kubernetes cluster and distribution <laughs> like that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I tend to I tend, tend tend to think of my YouTube channel like as a 
a TV station where I have different streams of content. So right now what I have on there is one devs on devs, which is developers on developers, um, where I kind of like interview other, you know, developers who are in the ecosystem who kind of people, you know, should aspire to be like, like, you know what I mean? Like the story is inspiring enough to say, Hey, you know, you don't have to do X and X and X. You don't have to be worried that you don't have a college degree. You can also get into tech or you don't even need to have a degree related to tech and you can get into tech. Cause a lot of people who I've been interviewing have that, you know, um, that, that, that story, you know, that background. And then I have another segment where it's just called in production, devs and devs in production, where I share tips and experiences that I've had and, you know, how to do X, Y, Z, you know, in production, you know, building a company, building a startup, you know, these are things that you should learn how to do. And I've got one other um, track, which is called Chuka Mentors, where I share like life, you know, tech related in some cases, but life advice, you know, like that this is what I was talking about. Like, you know, I would I remember I would say yes to everything before I figured out how to get it done. So I kind of gave that kind of message like, look, you know, you might think you don't have the knowledge or you think you don't have the skill set. Start out and then upscale your tech, you know, your skill set while you're trying to figure that out. You'd always get better. And and you can always do certifications. And to be honest, certifications they help and they're great, but Practical experience and practical knowledge is always is always yeah. key, in my yeah. opinion. Positive you know? can-do attitude and just you know resilience yeah. to figuring things out. I I hundred percent agree yep. that those are some of the most important skills in tech. And, and tech just sort of lay, leveled the playing field for anyone to yep. have a really great opportunity, um, despite their background, it's despite really their good. credentials, to get started. And then you know credentials become that thing that help you then continue to reinforce your your domain expertise on the more in the more fish, official capacity, but. So many people have entered tech either through gaming or through open source or through, you know, like for me it was GeoCities was one of the one of the things I started using back then. <laughs> so you know, yeah. and here we are, ten years, fifteen years later, right? So it's it's a hundred percent agree with that. It's it's awesome the the journey you've been on. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's been it's been great. Um, to be honest, if I came back to this world as something else, I'd probably still do tech. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's how much of a passion that I love for it. And and when I say tech in general, I don't still mean engineering, but you know, I'm a gadgets person. I love to figure out technology. You know, you just talked about my studio. You should have seen how excited I was over the last six months just trying to put this together. Yeah. You know, things like that. These kind of things excite me. That's that's where you find that's where I mean my element. So yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit of, you, you mentioned you do some freelancing with Gigster. I've heard about Gigster quite a bit. Um, you know, met mm. some people from the team a couple of years ago. They're doing mm -hmm. some really cool things. Tell us a little bit about Gigster, yeah. your experience with it. I mean, we especially love for people to hear about why it works for you as far as what your goals mm -hmm. are and how you know Gigster affords mm -hmm. you sort of the ability to work in what seems like a really great community of engineers, uh, but still being yeah. flexible to kind of pursue what your it sounds like your passion around startups. Yeah, yeah. So uh, funny story how we got into Gigster or how how we started with Gigster. Um, we, so as with every startup, we hit some money problems <laughs> at some point and we were trying to fundraise, but in the meantime, you know, um, a mutual friend, his name is E, um, he started out on Dell and some other companies, Florida Wave and the rest of them is great work, doing great stuff. So I, my co-founder, Lanry, we were, um, trying to figure out ways to get money into the company, even if it was from consulting or, you know, we're trying to keep the company afloat, you essentially make sure we can make payroll. And, you know, he then introduced and said, hey, look, maybe we could, we should talk to the chaps at Gigster. And I was like, who's Gigster? And then he says, oh, hey, these chaps, here I So it does an introductory email. Turns out the CTO at the time, Debo, um, and one of the co-founders actually, he uh, and my co-founder went to the same secondary school back in the day uh, when he was back home in I Nigeria. Yeah. Before. He's, he's great. He's, he's super brave. great guy. Yeah. He's intelligent. He thinks like 10 X. I mean, yeah. great individual. Right. Um, so 
Um, so, you know, we had a phone call. We told him the situation we were in. He said, okay, we'd still have to go through a regular interview process. So we got in about four of us, two engineers from our team, and then two product managers, and we got into the platform. So we, what we were doing was we were making uh, money. And every time we made money as individuals, we'll take 20% of whatever we made and pay, pay, give it to the company so the company could make our uh, payroll. So if 20% of all billings that we had from Gigster, uh, you know, came in, it kind of was like at least a pool enough to offset some of our monthly burn. Um, in terms of experience, the ride and the journey has been great so far. What Gigster actually does is they have enterprise clients, like so clients like Google and, you know, JSK and Canon and you know, Dentsu, you know, they've got quite a range of clients. and. They help them, you know, build software. So, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm saying the exact vision, right? But I think what they do is helping enterprise companies automate and, you know, automate their people and products, I think, or services, but something around that. But in plain English, they just, they're, they're like an outsourcing company. So yeah. these companies, even though they have an internal IT team, a good chunk of them do, but sometimes some problems are maybe too complex or they want outside perspective or they want fresh perspective. And that's where Gigster comes in. So they, they get a Gigster team together. Um, I was on the platform as a DevOps engineer, a full stack engineer, and a software architect. Because the distinct roles you can get on as five roles. I think a product manager, designer, and you know, dev back end engineer, front end engineer, um, DevOps engineer now, and a technical architect. So those are the roles that I remember off the top of my head. So um, they then get the project, they advertise that project to the community. That's the community of engineers who from all around the world. And it's, now it's actually very competitive to get in. It's not so easy to get in, right? Um, and uh, then each person does their role, right? So, you know, it's properly spec'd out. They even have, you know, um, um, what, what they call sales engineers who kind of like work with the client to spec out the problem and cost it adequately before then they put a budget together and then they tell you, okay, well, this is going to be a project for six months or three weeks or what have you. And this is what the payout looks like. Uh, do you want to do it? And then you can ask for more or less. I mean, you know, negotiate based on what you think you're bringing to the table. Uh, although these days it's pretty much fixed because kind of accurate right yeah. um and well, that's then... what i was so excited about when i heard talk to them yeah. was that they were thinking about software development in the capacity of maybe consulting or node sourcing what they were trying to do is break down sort of the converging reusable requirements across different projects streamline streamline yes. sort of like these platform concepts that would save you as the engineer time in delivering that value yes. but still allow you you know to earn and i think their pitch was something like earn a san francisco rate anywhere in the world so they were very remote mm -hmm. remote first from the beginning and, and so i you know i haven't yeah. touched base with them in probably two two years now but um mm -hmm. i was really excited about what they were that offering is that is international yeah community. that is that is absolutely correct like um the earnings are fantastic like i've i don't want to talk about what i've earned but Trust me, I, I, it, it is, it is, it is, I mean, it is, it, as an individual, it is good. I mean, sometimes some of the rates that I, I've gotten paid over um, a six months period when I look at my statement, um, you, you could have paid a smaller company to do that work. Yeah. And I earned that as an individual. So not only are the rates competitive because you're, it's direct sourced work, right? The other advantage there is like, you know, you, you're getting paid top dollar for your time. Well, and it's quality like, work too is the other thing that I, I heard about. Is yeah. It's like you're not, you know, you've seen some of these other, you know, marketplaces or whatever. You end up, you're like, you know, you're like installing Google ads trackers and stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, really? <laughs> but, but they're actually doing like real, you know, kind of advanced and there's some R&D. And I heard that there's, you know, platform engineers yeah. who get to work on some really cool stuff too. And. Trust me. Yeah. yeah there's cool. been projects, there's been projects that have been so like futuristic. I'm like, you know, and I've been on them and I've been privileged to be on those projects. Like these are projects that you probably wouldn't have been able to tackle on a regular day. And I've seen them in gigs. I've been part of some of those projects and, you know, it's been a, it's been a fast, fantastic, right? It's a great company. You know, um, they've, they've obviously gone through different, um, um, styles of management, the original co-founder, uh, you know, um, Roger left, uh, and then Chris came on board. Great guy as well. You know, um, he, he's, 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 you know, taken the company to, to new heights and, and, you know, I think, um, 
the the way they kind of like distribute labor is what I really like. You know, I think they're probably one of the fewer companies who's been able to show that remote work can actually work, you know, because yeah. they put processes in place that makes it easy and streamlined to get things done. You know, you don't have to be there in person and, and things work, you know, yeah. they've shipped out thousands of gigs. I can't even, can't even begin to mention. I sound like an advocate, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's going well. That's it, that's it's natural for you. That seems natural for you. You seem to find yourself yeah. in these intersections of enthusiasm around different technology uh, practices that, yeah. that are working. Well, I mean, I think that's valuable for people because you know one of the things that we think about a lot is just that remote setting, right? What does that look like now? Mm -hmm. We're leveling the playing field anywhere in the world. You can now have a meaningful technology profession doing good work at the highest levels, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, that's one of those, one of those avenues for people now, uh, in this day and age where they can find it. I mean, I'd love to, and I know, I know Tristan's burning to ask some questions, but I'd love to, to understand a little bit more, you know, how you work with people around the world in that remote capacity, especially in these engineering teams. Um, you know, what are some of the tools? I know we talked a little bit about, about GitOps and your role within the DevOps spectrum and different tools and tactics that you use. Love to hear a little bit more about, you know, I guess your, your technology stack. Um, as it relates to collaborating with others, especially in this sort of international setting. Mm, yeah. So three number, that's like, it, it, do, you can't do without tools. One, sure. Google Meet or Google something Meet. like Google yeah. Meet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're not really Zoom people. We're more Google Meet. And when I mean we're not Zoom, not like Zoom is a bad product. It's just um, Google Meet is more tailored towards what we do. Uh, or what we we kind of work with like Dexter, um, you know. And then number two, Slack, like everything Slack, right? And then three, Jira, Jira. right? These are like these are the three top tools that make collaboration easy, right? So Google Meet for actually in-person meetings, team check-ins, team sync, you know, sync ups, daily stand-ups. Um, Jira for the project to be properly organized on assigning tasks. In fact, Jira is probably the work engine of everything because without Jira, we would just be chickens in a barn, not knowing what we're doing, right? So, um, but but <laughs> but but Jira kind of like helps focus and you know put everybody in a tight lane in terms of scheduling, in terms of you know um, understanding what you're supposed to be doing, your deliverables, and also accurately trying to estimate your level of effort from on a week on week cadence. So uh, Jira is probably the workhorse there, right? Uh, and then, you know, like I said, Google Meet for meetings and, and Slack for like synchronous, like real-time communication. So these three tools are kind of like Gigster's core ecosystem. And I kind of like have borrowed that model in other freelance uh, projects or personal projects that I'm doing. And by the way, you know, Gigster is is such a beautiful platform that the way the projects are structured, you you absolutely can control your time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you can you can you can be doing a project on Gigster and doing something else and doing another personal project if you want because it's not like a nine to five. You know what I mean? You just yeah. have goals. You have um, targets, you have objectives, you have tickets, and you just have to get them done before when you say you'll get them done. So you kind of like can dictate everything. Like you tell them what your level of effort is, how long it takes you to get something done. And then when they put everything together in the sprint, you know, point of view, you know, everything just moves along day in, day out. So you can then in your schedule, you know, slot other things in. So those are kind of like the tools. And I, and those are the tools that like I use, like, every other day personally even when i'm working in other projects and, yeah. and, and all of that yeah what about on the devops side i mean that's the communication collaboration business Ooh, process side. yeah devops all right so i'm going to talk on two things so first is how it was done at gigster and then i could talk about you know how i do things now so at gigster uh, they had this platform one of the earlier engineers started out building and um, his name is Simon um, he was leading the team eventually then the team grew and then they got someone more senior but you know that's that's a side story point is he started the project to kind of like unify the devil's experience right so think about what you're doing as CTO.ai, but not as grandiose as what you're doing, if that makes any sense. Yeah. But he kind of had like 
had that vision, right? So that's why the first time I saw City, I was like, could instantly connect because I was like, okay, I understand what they're trying to do here. So they, they, you know, DevOps was a nightmare. Like imagine having whew, thousands of projects run yeah. by, you know, hundreds of teams and different developers all trying to get everything into production for different clients who have different metrics and different styles and so on and so forth. It was a nightmare. So the HQ engineers, the engineers who were, you know, working for Gigster at the time, um, you know, had a plethora of services and a plethora of projects that they had to keep their eyes on and monitor and make sure they were on, you know, up and running, you know, 24 seven. And it will give anybody a nightmare. And I don't care who you are, smartest person in the world, a nightmare. So they said, you know, Debor and Simon and a couple of other people, I forget their name now, they thought, okay, how can we unify and simplify this experience? How can we get engineers to use our technology or rephrase that our infrastructure to get client work into the cloud, not just in the dev environment or staging environment, but even production environment for clients who are willing to pay for it. So they started out a project and they called it the GDE, which was called the Gigster Development Environment. Mm. And essentially it leveraged Kubernetes, Vault, um, Circle CI to be able to, you know, automate everything with a command line tool. So we built a command line tool. I was actually one of the pioneering members who worked on that project, cool. who built that project. So I brought the Kubernetes experience there. So um, the point was you would check out a repository, you would authenticate via GitHub using the GitHub token, and then you, you know, you would type a bunch of commands which we'd already put together. And those commands would help you either build your image, push your, you know, deploy your image, or you know, yeah, actually that was it build or deploy the, the product <laughs> like it, it, you know so it, it was pretty much it and it was quite simple so you'd be a new developer and you'd finish doing your work or a developer signed to a new project you finished developing your work and you wanted to you know ship out the first version of it all you had to do was get the gd environment or we used to call it the gig cli anyway and then all you had to do was you know gig cli uh, build gig cli push and gig cli deploy Right. And eventually just became Geek CLI deployed because that kind of like you know encapsulated every other command in there. You know, it was a great tool, uh, was fantastic, it worked. It kind of like it kind of like reduced the ops time that the Geekster engineers had to work on because imagine having like a thousand developers throwing projects at you saying, Hey, we need to we need to develop this or it avoided DevOps developers team. from <laughs> that poor <DevOps> yeah. Team, right? <laughs> yeah yeah oh my goodness those guys i don't think they got any sleep they were always you know bag eyed and it was really <laughs> bad but um when they when they pushed the version one of it no matter how it was a bit clunky and you know it didn't work exactly but it was a version one and it, it kind of did like the most basic functionality and that's one thing i like simon for he was always you know let's get the basic functionality out first and then figure out all the bells and whistles later and we kept using that strategy and it matured to a point where that was what the whole network was using you know um of course there might still be exceptions for certain enterprises like you know some enterprises are still a bit too rigid they would still want things done a certain way but for most of the projects that was how they were able to get the projects up in production and they were able to unify and manage everything from like a single account. So centralized monitoring, centralized logging, and they just have to assign permissions to who needed to see what. Um, it was a great project. Um, you know, I did my bit. Um, and uh, I, I remember one experience, side story, I remember one experience where, you know, so HashiCorp has this tool called Vault yeah. that keeps secrets, right? Um, and that's what the Geek CLI tool was using. And it was backed by console, right? Console is like the, you know, the uh, service discovery yeah. platform. And console went down and Vault refused to start. So imagine thousands of developers and projects with all their secrets in Vault. Was that centralized and Vault is for all the projects? Yes. Yeah, okay. That's a bad uh, and, and, and Vault wasn't starting up. So users couldn't log into their accounts because you needed a GitHub token, which was stored in Vault. Yeah. You needed to get your permissions, which was stored in Vault. Um, um, containers that needed to start, all the secrets were stored in Vault. So if yeah. any container was restarting, gone. But all the ones that were still running, that was fine. So that was a really bad day. I mean, I... I, I <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't my crown to wear. It was Simon's. <laughs> but I remember, 
you know, we, we were up, you know, for close to four hours trying to figure out a way to solve the problem. But eventually, um, he did get around it. I think he found a way to, to get a, I think either he, he deployed a new version and then, you know, manually, you know, replicated secrets. I don't remember the exact strategies, but eventually solved the problem. But I mean, I remember that day. Not that's not a, a that's a not channel a great for day for you. Uh, uh, that's a that's a, a channel for you. That's a topic, uh, right? DevOps DevOps confessional when 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 shit starts. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, I'm yeah. telling you. But we, yeah, that that was a fun a, story. A similar but, implementation, and, and I I don't know that we necessarily did this out of design for that circumstance. Um, but what we did mm -hmm. was. We kind of created a hosted vault where we host it and we kind of built our own vaulting mechanism which is just resilient mm. on top of on top of cloud infrastructure but still has all the same premises and, and interfaces mm. to vault but it isn't actually vault under the hood um and then separately we uh, we allowed you to register your own vault and so what we ultimately created was a scenario where when you run your workflow your cli or you know in the case of slack ops we're not communicating with a centralized vault ever we're communicating with the, the we, even the user's vault on their infrastructure um, and they kind of mm. have the option, right? We give them a vault out of the out of the out of the box by default, um, you know, that mm. we wrote for that level of resilience, and then we give them the ability to bring their own to the table too, just in case they have mm. any kind of concerns that our resilience isn't <laughs> isn't there. Um, but I mean, that's why this like kind of DevOps confessional stuff I think is super cool because like I wouldn't have even thought yeah. about that necessarily. Well, I probably probably one of our smart engineers thought about that, and I'm just being like, oh, well, we didn't <laughs> think about that, but. You know, this when we start to talk about these types of d domain um, problems, people's experiences, especially the things where we we kind of had a failure case and we learned from it. You know, it's super valuable. I, you know, I, I would I think that's a that's a YouTube channel right there, DevOps Confession. Yeah, it is. It, it is. It is. I should I should I should get together and get Simon on my show and we should just talk about that cool. experience yeah. and you know, yeah, that'd be cool because you know, you know. It, I understand, I mean, you know, generally in engineering, you know, you never really want a single point of failure, right? Nobody really wants that. But secrets kind of like are the exception to that rule. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you have to figure out a good secrets management strategy and but you have to figure out a way to- clustered, right? Yeah. So I guess it's not like, you know, you still yeah. have a couple of nodes that are running and if two fail, then you're in trouble, I guess, but- yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so so if you notice, what what really happened was, console was kind of like the. Not only was it the, it wasn't the storage mechanism, but it was the mechanism that allowed the vault cluster find themselves. So it yeah. was a cluster, was clustered in three in HA mode. So the problem was, um, if anytime, okay, so the, the initial problem started with the nodes were restarted. I think they had to restart their nodes for some reason. I'm not sure. It was being hosted on EKS. No, it was being hosted on AWS, but using COPS, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they hadn't moved to GCP at the time. And AWS hadn't even launched their like native like Kubernetes service offering. So this was everything was still done manually. So they were hosting Vault in the Kubernetes cluster itself, but not even hosting Vault separately. Mm. And uh, and then console was also hosted in the Kubernetes cluster, not hosted outside of the cluster, you know? So when everything went down, what happened was, if you stay with me, um, Kubernetes came up, right? And then the pod started to come up. Now for Vault to work properly, console should come up first. Yeah. And console was also being set up in high availability mode. So it was in clustered mode. So for cluster, console to be fully online, all three nodes have to come up. So Console, and this was the implementation at the time, right? So console came, didn't, wasn't fully up yet and Vault tried to start. So at any time Vault tries to start and it cannot sync with all the other three um, servers for leader election or election to happen, something like that, um, the servers, the Vault servers are flying. Like it will be online, but you won't so be able to unlock it. Crash loop basically at that point. It, it, yeah. it, exactly, something like that. Yeah. So the the way to solve the problem. So it vault itself wasn't really faulty per se. It was console. So if we had if we were able to get console up and running with the previous data records and so on and so forth, and we had rebooted vault, vault would have worked, you know, automatically. Right. But we weren't able to get console up. So it's really about so restoring console. I mean, that's, a, that's the hard yeah. thing about these new <laughs> distributed systems, yeah. right? Especially in Kubernetes land. Yeah. You know, the order of importance in the dependency chain really, really matters. 
And um, yeah. you know, this is this is somewhere where like workflow tooling I think is really valuable. You talked a lot about GitOps and how you um, have used yeah. GitOps. I mean, tell us a little bit about mm-hmm. about how that applies to some of this infrastructure management, deployment pipelines. Um, you know, what yeah. you drive that for us? Yes, cool, cool. Um, so this is something I'm actually excited about now. Like this is 2020. Like so, um, traditional. So if we if we look at Sorry, small monologue. So if we if we look at traditional like DevOps deployments, what what we what we know today uh, and what we're used to typically is what I like to call well not I but a lot of people have coined the term CI ops right. So CI ops is essentially the flow of information and the flow of authority is handled by the central integration service, which is the CI server. So um, you have your central repository where the code lives, you push code to the central repository, your CI server, and then your, you know, your repository gets notified, notifies your CI server, your CI server gets the code, builds the code, pushes the code, and deploys the code. So you have to give permissions to your CI server, access to your repositories, access to your servers, access to everything, because he's the one who's coordinating everything. Now, if you're hosting the CI server yourself, where you're in full control, like maybe using Jenkins or something uh, like that, then I think you're all well and good. But if you're using a public uh, platform, like you know Travis, uh, you know public version, or maybe Circle CI, and you're even paying for it, you know you still have to give put your credentials there. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it; it's it's great, but it's just that was the trend, or that is the trend. Now enter GitOps, which is a different way of thinking, right? Because deploy, you don't share your deployment keys with anyone. So the way it works is you install agents, you install uh, op, GitOps agents on your nodes, right? Um, and then like something like Flux. Uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of Flux, but Flux is like a GitOps agent. It's, a, it's an ops agent, right? So you install them on your node and then you tell the GitHub, Git, GitHub agents that like Flux, like say, hey, look at this um, container repositories. Anytime changes are made to this container repositories, do fresh deployment with the new image. And then you tell it, look at this code repository. These are all the YAML files, you know, described for this application or this set of application on these nodes. Right. So anytime anybody makes a pull request to that repository, take the changes and inspect the state of the running cluster and inspect the state of the YAML files inside the repository as of the most recent commit. And if there's anything that has diverged, apply, you know, or subtract. That's interesting. I I didn't realize it had been decoupled to that. When you say that agent, is that agent typically running in the Kubernetes cluster then now? Yes, it is. It is. So it's running. Yeah. Yeah, I've more commonly seen, you know, where people are sort of more tightly, you know, uh, tightly coupling that with the actual CI pipeline, where the CI pipeline itself mm-hmm. has interpretary mm-hmm. code to read the source mm-hmm. that it's checking out and building. And then it's doing, you know, mm-hmm. and the problem that we've always seen with this is, you know, as nice as it is, is to be able to write your instructions in YAML and like have some machine parse it yeah. and know what to do. Like you got to actually be mm-hmm. able to like translate for the machine and understand these sort of yeah. weird, you know, like YAML isn't the best way to declare. And, and especially for things yeah. that are like less automated, let's say like a human in the loop thing. And so what we've been trying mm-hmm. to think about is like, how do we take that, that automated ability of a CI pipeline and, and still have that premise of, you know, fully automated, no human interaction. It just works based on rules and declarative stuff but then also mm-hmm. allow you to surface that into places like Slack for two reasons. One, a human can be in the loop on certain decision-making things, which broadens the, the horizon of what you can use this kind of powerful automation for. And what we see often is one of the things that puts a lot of pressure on dev and DevOps teams is the need for less technical constituents to be supported because mm-hmm. the pipeline's failing and I don't know why it's interpreting this YAML this way or whatever, right? And so for those things that can be a little bit more, let's say subjective, or you know, for just driving the the power of automation into the the broader you know stakeholder group in the organization, things like your support team, things like you know web developers who maybe don't understand the back end. We've been trying to rethink DevOps and CI CD and Git Ops in such a way where you get that human in the loop interaction out of it, which it can be an extension of that declarative, fully automatable and fully reproducible build. What's really interesting about what you're saying to me is the paradigm where now the Kubernetes cluster is essentially just sitting and listening and responding. Does it have rules and how, how are you basically like, it, 
is this where like open policy agent comes in and, and some of these other projects? Can you expand a little bit more? Yeah. So not, not actually none, the agent does most of all the work. So it's, it's, um, it's a tool. I mean, the, the, the paradigm itself, is it Novell, you know, but the way they, the way they implemented it, I think is kind of new, right? Um, Kelsey Hightower did some sort of demo without even Flux, which came with that paradigm. And I think they just built on that paradigm. Now, the way it works is this Flux is the singular agent that kind of orchestrates all deployment. And all Flux is, is just um, a, think of it like a tool that inspects YAML files, right? And then inspects the state of running applications and just make sure that they're both in sync. So if you tell it, these are the YAML files I'm sending you, then it will say, okay, I've seen this new YAML file and I'm seeing what is deployed and then whatever is diverged, it will just apply it. So, but then there's no human effort involved. It's just an application. Essentially, you don't need to give access to any developer or any engineer. You don't need to give any of them access to your running, you know, cluster, That's right? Fair. So that whole bit is abstracted away from the engineers. But is right? it That's kind, the of, first thing. kind of like uh, limited in its interpretation? Like it understands Helm charts, it understands Kubernetes syntax, but it may not be able to yeah. run kind of like logic as code. Is that kind of the general? <laughs> No, no. So yeah, it only, it only, you're right. So that's, that's, that. so it understands Helm charts. Actually, um, Helm is probably one of its biggest strengths. So if you package your code as Helm charts, probably easier to, to work with, okay. but it understands raw, you know, YAML files. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think you can run custom, like, you know, code, like bash scripts or things like that. You okay. probably have to figure out a way to, to get, um, Helm to do that or get, but you can use customize. So um, it, it's customizable. Like an ephemeral container or a temporary container that has code in it, I guess, if you really wanted to get into that. World if you really wanted, or you would use, yeah, or you'd use it. Oh, you'd use init containers. Like init right. containers can do the work before deployments. I mean, like, so it's just actually thinking, how can I automate this without getting a human involved? And if it's something that's repeatable, init containers can do the work before, you know, and then get the containers up and running. So I've not really had a situation where I needed to run custom code. If I'd have actually not needed to run custom code, right? But the beautiful thing about that process is your CI becomes your CI. Like that's all it does. It takes check text code changes between the you know actual action re so, so first of all, it separates, it allows you to separate application from infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have application state and you have infrastructure, you know, state. So you can use something like um um HashiCorp's uh what's it called Terraform mm -hmm. to manage infrastructure state and then regular to manage your business logic for your apps. And then you can use a regular repository to handle, you know, application state, if that makes any sense. You know, so um, if you if you ran, if you were in the world of microservices where you had like 20 services or 30 services, right? And, you know, all the images and all the container images are hosted in repositories scattered all around the web, but you're using your YAML files to kind of declaratively define how that application to be deployed in each environment or different environments. That is what Flux would do for you. So, and Flux doesn't keep the, 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 the definition files themselves. Flux connects to a repository, which you tell it where the, you know, those definition files themselves. So a typical deployment will be, I have my code repository for my applications and my services. I have a um, repository for the you know YAML or definitions saying okay here are uh, install so so let me let me give you an example like the way Flux works and it works locally it works anywhere if I lost my laptop today right if I lost my laptop today um, I wish I could share my desktop and show you what I meant but if you I lost my laptop can. today yeah you certainly can you can share your I could? stuff yeah, I could? yeah there's no nothing on our yeah. side to stop you from I was, I was sending uh, okay. Tristan the links to Flux. Uh, cd.io right now. So CD. He'll usually yeah. bring this up on the screen, but feel free to share your screen. Okay, cool. Let me, let me, this is weird. I wasn't prepared for this. Okay, let, let me do this. Uh, we're, going, we're going live. Uh, we're deploying, we're deploying live. <laughs> so so I just got to show some this code. Is, this is super <laughs> cool. Cause like, you know, what I, what I wasn't aware of this project and, and what I hear is sort of 
um, a step away from this idea of tightly coupling this to the CI/CD environment, which seemed to be the trend, especially with you know, I'd love to hear what you, how you think about this relative to something like GitHub Actions or you know, I think Circle CI has orbs now. Uh, essentially, these idea of these yeah. different like workflows that happen within the CI/CD environment. This kind of changes that paradigm quite a bit. I, I would expect. Yeah, yeah, it it, it does, it does, because um, I I used to use I used to use um, uh, I used to use orbs before. I used to use Circle CI orbs actually, and um, I don't know if my is my screen showing up. Yeah, right? we got you there. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So I used to use Circle CI orbs, and you know that saved my life a bunch because I used to always repeat stuff, but not anymore, right? So I'm gonna use. I'm gonna. I, I might not be able to do everything like immediately because I, I should have prepared for this one. That's uh, okay. Tristan told yeah. me I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no but anyway, <laughs> so this is what a typical like flux um you know repo would look like like this is where i keep my customized files and this is where i keep my like um like regular helm files and this is what a definition so i tell it okay so um and just tell everyone yeah, what customize getting excited. is real quick what, what's customize yeah yeah okay ah so much information <laughs> get excited all right so customize is a tool that allows individuals to kind of like um declaratively overwrite or reuse, yes, reuse configuration, right? So um, I actually did a YouTube video. Okay, well done. I didn't do a YouTube video on customize. I did a YouTube video on scaffold, but um, essentially customize allows you declare your um, environment once, all right? So you'd have like your base configuration, right? Because think about it, when we do deployments, development is not typically so different or far off from staging and it's not so different or far off from production, right? The only thing that makes, should make it different is the resources that they consume. So development should point to a separate set of databases and, and staging should point to a set of, you know, separate set of databases or, you know, um, the staging environment of third party services that you're using. But outside of that, the code and the business logic should be the same across environments, right? So if, if you think about things that way, you wouldn't want to always, okay, for, for deployment for this cluster or for this namespace, depending on how you, you segment your environment, you would say, okay, base deployment, um, dev here, right? And then you would either have to use some sort of special bash scripts to template out your YAML files to get it into another environment. But with customize, you don't need to do that. You just specify the base. I think I could show you a sample file. So like think of, um, do I have anything here? Yes, I do, right? So, uh, okay. <laughs> this is my local environment. Let me let me show you a production environment, which well nobody has access to, so it's okay. Poseidon. Wow, um, oh, showing live code. Can't believe I'm doing that. <laughs> and the show uh, repositories. Poseidon, where are you? There we go. Okay. So now, this is this is what a typical base looks like, right? So. Um, I'd use this service. Right? So this is the this is the actual deployment file, and notice that the deployment file is kind of basic. It doesn't have any namespace. It just has the image name. But notice that the image path to the repository isn't there. But this is what I will typically need to get this deployed, right? So this is like the base itself. But then let's say I want it deployed for um, development. I would say okay, I'll, def I'll define what it should look like in development. And that's what a customization mm. technically is, so right? So it's like so you're able to extend it per environment and extend the different configurations. Yeah, yeah. You took the words right out of my mouth, yeah. but that's it. So this, this is the extension. So I tell it, okay, this is the base configuration, but for this configuration, use the config var variables in this folder for dev, and then use this, you know, uh, Docker image, you know, you run one replica. But if it was production, run three replicas. If it was staging, run two replicas, and so on and so forth. And you can then target several changes based on the different environments that you want to run, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so that's what customize is. Uh, I wish I could spend more on this, but let me let me quickly switch back to where I was going with Flux, right? right. So if you notice, I have, I do have, okay, 
I don't have it running, but I do have a Kubernetes cluster running locally. So all my local apps, like I don't run like my SQL or, you know, MongoDB or I don't run any of those things. Like I don't use the default Mac installer packages. I use everything is running in Kubernetes. So if I kill this Kubernetes server, right, it will kill my MongoDB kill, freeing up a lot of resources for me, anything Redis, all of that. I literally install all my apps using Kubernetes, right? But guess what? If I lost this laptop today, like if, if I misplaced it, to get all the apps that I was working on or all the apps that I use on a day-to-day -day cadence back up and running, all I have to do is first of all, install Flux locally on my system. Um, and I'm using Helm to install Flux, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's amazing. Uh, hold on. So you're actually using this locally uh, then as well as you're saying rather than, uh, wow. One of the challenges yes, that I'm we using. find is just, you know, typically, you know, Kubernetes can be quite heavy when you're using it yes. in your local development environment. You know, you're obviously mm -hmm. using, it looks like Docker's uh, version of Kubernetes, mm -hmm. but we've often used uh, Minikube. Um, you know, so yeah. it's, it's a little bit surprising to me that you're using it locally, but, um, you know, I guess you've been able to work around how to make sure that your your services are light enough and maybe avoiding Minikube also helps a little bit as well. Yeah, well, so I'm not using Minikube, I'm using like the native yeah. Docker for Mac. Like it has Kubernetes inbuilt, yeah. right? So, which is slightly lighter than Minikube. Minikube is slightly heavier because it, it uses like a Docker in Docker concept. Like it yeah. uses like, a, I don't know how to explain it. But, I just but yeah, this so- this new project called Nestybox that you should look into. Um, these, huh. they were doing sort of like a new Docker and Docker, and they just came out with um, a cool Kubernetes in Docker that's supposed to be lighter weight than both of them. And they're looking for people huh. to kind of try it out. They started out as, you know, just a new Docker and Docker, but um, it seems like it's on the path to providing you essentially this even lighter weight Kubernetes that just runs inside of a, a Docker container. We're going to take a look at it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. I'll, I'll check it out. Cool. Anyway, so you're right. Um, it, 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 you know, if, if you look here, uh, let me just show this real quick. So I've said, hey, look, I want three namespaces. I want the system namespace. I want the development namespace. I want cert manager namespace, right? And for workloads, I want, for the Helm workloads, I want MongoDB, right? This is why I define everything declaratively. So if I wanted to upgrade the MongoDB on my local machine, all I have to do is come here, update the, update the, make a PR, update the chart, deploy it, and then Flux, which is running on my system, is going to see the change to this repository and automatically initiate a new, you know, deployment. And that way, even if I set up a new application from scratch, like, sorry, a new laptop from scratch, and I said, oh, um, go, all I have to do is install Flux and connect that Flux deployment to this repository and it will see the application state and it will just go and replicate it and make sure that they're the same. And that is powerful. Like, you know how difficult it is when you're setting up a new application, a new laptop every single time? Like, so even if I had engineers who were gonna work with me locally, like we're gonna do pair programming and I wanted to get the environment up and running, Flux can do it for you. So I reverse engineered the concept for production and I just used it locally that's and it, cool. it kind of works. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, this is, uh, this is kind of the trend of where things are going is so cloud integrated, yep. and, you know, now that, you know, when you think about all the containers and Kubernetes and all this, it's, it's not like you can, it's hard to run your local environment in such a way where it doesn't depend on one of these third party services now anyway. So why not leverage your sort of production <laughs> workflow in a mm -hmm. remote environment? As long as you you know have a pull mechanism, it sounds like Flux is able to connect through the GitHub token. Do you ever run into any sort of mm -hmm. local tunneling where you have to communicate the other way? I no, I haven't. I haven't had the need to. You know what I mean? Like I've I've not had the need to. Um, no, honestly. Like so, the way my workflow is. Um, so I use Scaffold. So Scaffold is also a tool that allows you to kind of like develop using the microservices architecture, but I'm sure it's probably just individuals like me who do that. Like there are a lot of people who probably start up all their services locally, you know, find a way to do everything locally without using Docker. But um, I'm, me and my team, we kind of like, we don't want variants in our environments. Like, so if someone is using Linux and someone else is using, you know, Mac and they're working with a node, um, module you know how it's built on a mac is different from how it's built on on windows so how it's built on linux and you can find situations where 
you know, it will start on one someone's laptop, laptop and it won't start on someone else's laptop. So we, we try to eradicate things like that and we kind of use Docker to develop. Now, the problem with Docker, well, not problem, the, 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 the thing with Docker is that it can be resource uh, you That's know, where we run not everybody. Too, yeah. yeah, you get to a yeah, point where it's yeah. run, you can only run certain services <laughs> yeah. locally at it. Uh, time. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not not everybody not everybody can run like so. Except you have a machine like mine where you have like 32 gig and you have lots of processing power, you calls and blah blah blah. You know, not everybody can run everything um, um, locally. So we still always have to pair that with people who can start it up locally. But we always make sure that when they make their pull requests, that the CI pipeline can pass and build and test everything. And if anything goes wrong, then we'll just let them know, okay, hey, you might need to swap out this module you're using or something or blah, blah, blah. You know, but um, but Scaffold helps developers do everything locally. So the beautiful thing is Docker is resource cons you know, it's it's your laptop is not strong enough to work low, then you can use Scaffold to work with a remote server. So, mm -hmm. like, um, um, I wish I had project up and running. I should have gotten a project okay. up and running. But anyway, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but what is so think of it this way. Um, are you guys still with me? Yeah, we're still with you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I just I thought the thing froze. Uh, you know what? I'm just I frozen in, in awe. <laughs> yeah. let, let me change. This has been this has been awesome. I'm I'm glad you like took over yeah, and gave dive. us a, a peek. Yeah, deep dive. It would... On that local development environment, one of the things we've thrown around a little bit, you know, because we're hesitant to put everything in the cloud. You know, I love to be able to do development on the plane when I'm flying between meetings. Um, is one of the things we've tried to play around with is the idea of sort of like a progressively enhanced environment where you can still kind of develop locally with minimal kind of like overhead of different environments, but you can progressively move into an integration phase, right? So you might even have two local environments, one where you run just using Docker Compose, right? Uh, and then the second where you might spin up something like Minikube, and then a third where you're actually using that fully cloud integrated GitOps pipeline. but. The, the difference between environments is obviously the big trade-off there, um, which is less than ideal. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, sorry, I, I had internet connectivity issues, but I'm back now. So the thing I, I was trying to explain, which is to further your point, is with Scaffold, you can use a remote environment to develop locally. Okay. Like, And you, you it's so seamless, you wouldn't even know that it is a remote environment. Like What's so, the you would just do a one? scaffold CNCF as well. Scaffold, scaffold, like S K A F F O L D dot dev, like dot dev. Got it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just. just oh yeah. Sure. S K A F F. Yeah. 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 Scaffold dot dev, and with that, you can like develop locally and with a remote backend. So, if you're one of those individuals who's got a laptop that's just powerful enough to run Docker, there we go. And it's not powerful to run Docker. Like Scaffold is the tool to help you out there. So you could have like a throwaway play cluster, or you could use a namespace in your cluster and assign it to engineers, and they could use the compute power in the cloud while developing locally. But the way it works is that it would kind of like, um, not only would it deploy the project and kind of like reboot it or hot reload it where it needs to, but it also sync your local files into the containers running in the cloud. Oh, that's cool. Making it feel like, yeah, the containers running in the cloud are local to you. And that way you can use compute resources while developing locally. That's, that's huge. That's fantastic. Because we, we have like yeah. a, a CI, CI, CI environment workflow where if you, you, you tag, it'll create a preview environment with a special URL where your container gets deployed. Mm. You can leverage the, the shared resources in the cluster while differentiating your deployment. Mm. Um, but the challenge there is you have to go through the whole CI CD process, which, you know, when you talk about testing and all this other stuff means you really are slowing down those iteration loops of, of testing your, your work. Right. So you're saying that this actually yeah. will allow me to mount my local file system and it'll sort of, what does it do? Like our sync or something. Um, or just like yeah, I think it, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's our sync. I think it's our sync. Like it's and it's fast. Like it's yeah. insanely fast. I I forget sometimes that I'm working in the cloud. That's how 
good it is. You know what I mean? Like, so um, it, it hot loads it and, it, you know, it's declarative. You can tell it, okay, not the whole container, just this folder or just that folder, you know, and so on and so forth. Like maybe if you're coding in Windows, but your hosting environment is is Docker or sorry, or Linux, you could, you could tell it that, okay, ignore, like if it's JavaScript, ignore the node mode use folder. Like don't sync that. Use the node mode use folder in the container, but use the actual container files here. And you can hook that up with node mode so that every time you make changes, um, it will know that files have changed. And if your project is the kind of project that needs to reboot, it will restart the container automatically. But if it's, if it's a, um, so that's a reload, but if it's a hot reload where it doesn't need to reboot the container, it will just swap out the files. It's like a web, and you would hot see reload it. with WebKit or something like that. Exactly, and it will just it will just do an rsync and and scaffold is powerful. Like people don't know, so um, that's that's the new way to develop. So you don't you could you literally use like a Chromebook to develop. You know, like you don't need compute resources on your Chromebook. You're changing my mind. I, I've been one of those people who will tweet every now and then, like the future of development is not you know sincerely in the cloud. You know, we like to have our local development environments. It's you know, it's great to be able to unplug from the internet and still be able to build software. But I guess if, if it's going to get this um, hybrid, right, I guess, right, where you can still develop with the, you know, the rapid feedback loops of your local terminal, you know, your local file system, and then behind the scenes where we're able to synchronize at that pace, then maybe it is here. It just, I didn't see it happening with this CI CD paradigm, but I definitely can see it happening with what you're describing around scaffold and, um, and flux as well. This is, a, this is a paradigm shift for me. Uh, Chuka, you're opening my eyes to a brave new world. <laughs> That's what I'm here to do, but to rock that table, man. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. This is great. Yeah, this, um, is, this, is, this is great, Chuka. I mean, we can, we can keep going, it seems like, the rest of the day, potentially. <laughs> the longest option. But I'm ever. here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, just keep throwing questions at me and I'm going to keep getting excited and I'm yeah. going to keep talking. That's it. That's it. Unless you shut it down. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like we should probably wrap it up because we're getting to an hour here and then what yep. we should do is uh, yep. take it offline and find another opportunity to do some more exciting chatting on, on some of this stuff. Chuka. You're, you're, uh, you're killing it. This is great. <laughs> Thanks so much, man. Thanks so much, Kyle. Thanks so much, Tristan. I mean, uh, this has been fun. Like you said, if you didn't point out to me that this was over an hour, I wouldn't have known. I just keep <laughs> going and you keep going. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, exciting. We'll have to do Go it ahead. again. We'll have to do it again. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, you know, I'm I'm up for it. Schedule it in advance, and maybe this time I'll be you know prepared with some sort of like maybe to show off some of the things I'm talking about and see it in action. Because you know, there's always a lot of people like like yeah, he's chatting crap. That's not possible. But if someone sees it, like uh, you know, this you did is a how great this job works. Today. I can tell just from your how you <laughs> dove in and explained it confidently that it's all gonna work exactly the way. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It is. It is. It's, it's what I use on an ongoing. I'm, it's not something I. I I want to get to it is where I am at now. That's what I do. Right? So um, I'm, and I'm hoping a lot of people who would, you know, I mean, like, just like the way I'm beginning to change your mind thinking about, you know, development in the cloud. I'm hoping, you know, that it is a way for teams who are building products that have like humongous micro microservices, right? So think about starting up, you, you had a project that had 20 services and you had to do some debugging. Think about the stress it will take for you to change into each directory, kick each one up and running, run terminal windows to keep to monitor everything so that you can figure out where what problem in what service there's an issue with, right? Scaffold can help you there, right? Scaffold can can and if you want to keep the same unified experience, you can use like I, in my CI server, the only thing that I run is scaffold build. That's all my Circle CI server runs. So the code is local, the same code that I used to develop, scaffold develop to tell it that I want an, you know, an iterative loop. I want to be able to, you know, add breakpoints and stuff. But then it's the same code that works locally that my CI engine will use to build my container images. And then once those are built, right, Flux does the rest. And that's the pipeline. Like it's one, two, three, three steps. Three steps that's i've never it has never been this condensed before like if if you were building a full ci pipeline i'm sure you know what you're running cto.ai so, so you know what i'm talking about yeah. like those circle ci scripts or those travis scripts or those jenkins scripts like you have to do many definitions think about different things templates so on and so forth which is fun by the way and it automates a lot of things but to condense some of those tasks into like just four steps 
that are simple and straightforward, oof, you want we're getting somewhere. With the simplicity of the of the uh, of an inter a developer experience that's not, you know, requiring you to deal with all so, the overhead of the complexity at the end of the and the power, right? This, we think about that every that day. Mean? Every day, it's you yep. know, How do we bring the CLI yep. to Slack? And I think uh, I think after this conversation, we should we should chat a little bit more about what the future of these CI pipelines actually is because. You know, it's it's less clear. It's less clear now that you're you're shifting the paradigm like this. <laughs> Look, here, here's a fun here's a fun thought for you. I would like to see something. I I know Tristan will throw it back to me and say, "Hey, why don't you build it?" But I'm going to throw it out here. I'd like to see something where CDO dot AI or the, your Slack bot would allow me to do something like set up these three tools like okay give me a provision cluster give me a new repository and give me a sample application and then show me what it will be like to get all my other applications up and running with you know one slack call like that's, that's, you know what i mean that sounds like, like everything I, that sounds like the ops mesh so you know what we started out with this idea of commands which are the cli but just like you can declare these mm -hmm. commands we also want you to be able to declare your CI pipelines, declare your web services, and we want to be able to interpret yeah. those from a YML and then not just deploy your web service, you know, kind of like a Kubernetes manifest, not just deploy your pipelines, kind of like a CI CD pipeline, but also then have the non-discoverable interactions, the human in the loop interactions. And, and where we want to go with this is then also, you know, and this is something we're starting to, to roll out is um, having event driven workflows where those disparate systems that are maybe pushing in are able to send events mm. so you can create, um, you know, a storyboard, a life cycle kind of uh, visualization of what's happening within your systems. But also you can start to sequence things, you know, sort of an if this, then that, mm. where you have the option of fully automatable pipelines, which require no interaction and there's fully declarative models. But then also have the scenarios where maybe you want to raise something that's human in the loop for your QA team or for your project manager. Um, but Slack becomes that place where we decided to start there because, you know, we just looked at this problem really hard and said, you know, ultimately, like, where is the future of DevOps going? Well, this GitOps stuff and everything with cloud native is exciting. So let's definitely embrace cloud native and, and containers in this. But then separately, we said, we think the world's going remote and we need to bring dev tools to where communication and collaboration has. What's the problem with chat ops? Well, it's always been too expensive to build. It's always been something where you had to go build mm. your more servers and it meant more DevOps and, mm -hmm. you know, and so people just built CLIs. Well, what if you just wrote a CLI that ran in Slack? And now that we've proven out that paradigm and our customers are really getting a lot of efficiency from distributing, you know, creating what we think of as the 10X developer paradigm, one person who makes five others two times more productive. I mean, that's you. 100% I can tell based on what you're doing. <laughs> We're now starting to think about CI, CD pipelines, microservices, and, and how do you encapsulate those while also driving you know actual data out of the into the feedback loop? Because the other problem that we're trying to solve is in a lot of businesses, the dev teams are just not afforded the time to really embrace this kind of automation and get through the technical learning mm. curve. And the more we can build a business case around automation with this data, the more investment stakeholders, business stakeholders especially, are going to make into the software development tools that we all use, which will, again, simplify them, make them easier. So like you said earlier, I mean, there's there's a grandiose vision, uh, which I think we should we should unpack maybe after this call so that we're not giving away all of our, <laughs> all our secrets live. <laughs> Definitely. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is awesome, Great. Chuka. I mean, we'll need to schedule another one in. Uh, we'll need to talk a little bit more. And uh, but, you know, I think we I'll drop all your links um, into the into the into the description. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Really it's been it. my pleasure, Kyle. It's been my pleasure, Tristan. Uh, and I love the CTO, the AI product, man. It's great. Thanks, great man. Work. We appreciate that a ton. <laughs> Take us out, Kyle. That's it for the Op Show for today. Bye.